France. For many of us, that means tourist attractions, busy streets and stylish cafes. But head deeper into the country and you'll discover a France that's wild and unchanged. I really love France. It's a naturalist's dream. And the reason for that is all the different habitats that you find here. In this series, I'm going to explore them in search of the many hidden wonders that there are to be found in wild France. I'll be traveling to some of the most spectacular regions of France, from the snow-capped mountains to the rolling plains, from deep forest to the rugged coastline. I'll be exploring the unique plants and wildlife that thrive in this unspoilt wilderness and the secrets that are hidden deep within it. That's amazing. On my adventure through wild France. When I was a child, there was a movie called The Land That Time Forgot. And, uh, well, if there's one part of France that you could describe in that way, it has to be this. This is the Cévennes. It's an incredibly rugged landscape with hardly any people. This is the least populated region of France. And for naturalists, it's a hidden treasure trove. I can't wait to explore it. The Cévennes is situated in central southern France. The area is roughly the size of London, but it's sparsely populated. With only 64,000 inhabitants, that's not even enough to fill Wembley Stadium. It's a place so wild that you are far more aware of the animal inhabitants than the human ones. My journey will take me from the high limestone plateau down into the silent wooded valleys of the interior. I'll be discovering the predators that have roamed this land for hundreds of years. Robert Louis Stevenson, the great British novelist, came here. In fact, he wrote a lovely book about trekking through the Cévennes with donkeys. And it could well be that this was the landscape that inspired his greatest work, Treasure Island. Certainly, I like to think so. There's a brooding stillness here that lingers in the rocky outcrops and green forests of the Cévennes. It's a feeling that is heightened by haunting signs of the past. This is the plateau right on top of the Cévennes. And uh, it's a fascinating landscape, bigger fields here. And there are these mysterious standing stones, these megaliths. Not much is known about them. What we do know is they're made of granite and they were moved here from several kilometers away. So it was an awful lot of work because some of them weigh several tons. So they must have been important to the people who put them here. One of the biggest mysteries about these stones is their location high up on the plateau where not much grows. One suggestion is that in the early stone age, people would have gathered here to hunt. Bones, have been found here from woolly-haired mammals, wild horses, and hyenas. But any bones scattered across the landscape these days are cleared up by the giant scavengers who swoop through the skies. Ah, oh, that's great. Look at this. Some great vulture action. This is a griffon vulture. They're so graceful, slow flying really slow wing beats. That's wonderful. With a wingspan of nearly three meters, they can cover vast distances in no time. And their eyesight is so good they can see a dead rabbit on the ground three kilometers away. Even with the scope, they can see me much better than I can see them. Constant Bagnolini is an ornithologist who's been working with the vultures for 25 years. So I'm looking here, I think uh, these are griffon vultures, yes? Yes. 30 years ago, the vulture completely disappeared. 
the sky is empty of the vulture. Why did the original birds disappear? Oh, the vulture disappeared principally by the fault of human, by gun and poisoned. Okay. The poison is not for the vulture, it's for the fox. The poison is not selective and the vulture disappear very quickly. And I assume now that the poisoning of foxes is controlled? Now in my area, in my country, it's forbidden. It's totally uh, forbidden. With vultures coming home to the Cévennes, the ecosystem is slowly returning to an older way of life. There are now four types of vulture, including 450 pairs of griffon vultures, 20 pairs of black vultures, and also very rare Egyptian and bearded species. The griffon vulture and the black vulture reintroduce. The Egyptian vulture return naturally. Just two breeding pairs. It's not much, but it's a, a great success. You'd think these different types of vultures would compete for food, but actually each vulture eats a different part of the dead animal. The griffon vulture prefer the soft meat, like uh, muscle, intestine, the black vulture prefer the contrary, the hard part, like uh, uh, cartilage, skin. The Egyptian vulture can clean all the rest. A lot of people who haven't perhaps taken the time to look might think the vulture is an ugly bird. But I think you really love the vulture. Yes, the vulture is very, uh, uh, very beautiful, very beautiful. I think all, all species that have difficulties in nature need a champion. Yes. Eh? Je pense que vous êtes un grand champion pour les vultures. <laughs> Merci. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>
but some locals believe that they are a menace and that they will prey on livestock. The hierarchy here is clear. Once the wolves are fed, it's time for the birds to swoop in. And already we've got ravens and we've got a uh, magpie yeah. there and, and the vultures coming down. To see wolves and vultures living together here so successfully perhaps provides us a glimpse of the future of the ecosystem of the savannah. Wonderful sight, but an incredibly complicated uh, political future for the wolf. And uh, very interesting to see what's going on here. I'm traveling through the Cévennes National Park in France. As I get deeper into the landscape, I get a sense of how remote this area is. You can travel a long way here before you come across another human being. The roads here are really windy, and very tiring, so it's good to stop occasionally. And as you can see, the terrain is very dramatic and so is the weather. This is what in weather terms would be called a Sevenol episode, the mixing of Atlantic and Mediterranean weather fronts. And the result of that is tremendous storms. And one of the features of the storms here is a very fast downpour of a large amount of rain. And in steep terrain like that, it runs straight off and can cause massive flooding miles away, way downstream. It's also challenging terrain to live and to farm. As a consequence, you see lots of terracing put in by local people. But they do benefit from the incredible humidity that you get here. Humid conditions that are perfect for the growing of all sorts of things. This area may be uninhabited by humans, but there's a whole secret city tucked away if you know where to look. These unusual looking houses are actually beehives. Right, put the, put the protective gear on, okay? That's good. Excellent. Now we can work with the bees. I'm sure there's no problem, but it's always wise to take some precautions. Is it fetching? Oh yes, very good. I'm meeting local beekeeper, Yves Laurent. Yves keeps bees in a traditional way that is unique to the Cévennes. The hives are made from all natural resources found in the area. The base is carved from a tree trunk and schist rock is put on the top to protect them from the elements. The smoke makes them a little groggy. Looking underneath now. Oh, look at that. You can see there the combs hanging down underneath. And that's exactly how bees prepare their comb and their honey in the wild. They look for a hollow in a tree, an old bird's nest, woodpecker's nest. And they'll prepare galleries just like that. It's completely as it's intended to be in nature. In summer, there are over 30,000 bees living in these hives. C'est très joli. It's very beautiful. Merci.
These are European black bees. Whilst other bees around the world are dwindling in numbers, surprisingly the bees in the Cévennes are doing very well. It's thought that one of the reasons for this is because there is no intensive farming in this protected region, and therefore no pesticides that are harmful to bees. This age-old method of beekeeping, using local trees and resources, has been passed down through generations of beekeepers. So basically, you, so you learn the technique from an old man who was one of the last practitioners of this method, and today you are passing it on. And you've taught people in England, Scotland, Germany, and it's an, I, like, I like what you say, that it's a, an ancient technique for the future. C'est très bon. Exactement. <laughs> Tu veux goûter Oh oui. Voilà, ça c'est du miel d'ici. So this is the honey voilà. from here. De, de, de l'été dernier. From last year. Yeah. Voilà. Last summer. Mm. Yeah. Let's try a little bit of this. Oh, it smells lovely. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I can smell the, les, les herbes. Oui. That is wonderful. Formidable. Naturel. Oui. C'est du vrai miel d'abeille. The, 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 the true honey of the bee. Oui. L'abeille originale. Oui, comme les abeilles mangent le miel. C'est du miel comme les abeilles mangent elles. C'est du miel naturel, ça. Totally natural honey. You can't get better than that. Merci. Encore. Again, I'm going to have some more. Why not? This whole region has a magical feel to it, and there's a final habitat I'm keen to explore further, the real heart of the Cévennes, the forest. One thing you notice as you travel deeper into the forest is that it's very rocky underfoot, and this rocky landscape is hard for trees to colonize. But there is one tree that does flourish here. From the acidic soil beneath the schist, grows the sweet chestnut tree. Laurent Fossard is a local chestnut farmer. His family have grown chestnuts here for generations, and he's going to show me how he works with these wonderful trees. So this is a, this wild chestnut has grown really straight, and the wood's strong and good for making beams of houses, but you don't eat them. Alors c'est très simple, c'est parce que le fruit est très difficile à éplucher. So it's, because it's difficult to open? Très difficile. Voilà. <laughs> That's interesting. So you, you basically you graft varieties to make them easier to open. C'est ça. It makes a lot of sense. C'est ça. Okay, can I see that? Ouais. On y va. Grafting new shoots onto strong wild trees makes the perfect fruit. Alors, ici. Hop. Grafting usually takes place in early spring. A healthy shoot is removed from one tree and a slit is made in the trunk of a second tree. Comme ça. Voilà. Très bien. And the shoot is spliced in. So the young, fresh shoot of one tree starts to grow from the sturdy trunk of the wild tree, merging the two together. Et dans dix ans, il y aura de belles châtaignes. And in ten years, you have beautiful chestnuts. <laughs> and so that's what happened to this tree hundreds of years ago. Voilà. Donc ici, on a un très vieux châtaignier, à peu près... 350 à 400 ans. Yeah, 300, it's an old tree, 350 to 400 years old, voilà, definitely. Yeah. À peu près. Et c'est un châtaignier qui a été greffé. On voit ici, ici, le point de greffe. So this is, it's been grafted, and this, this line you can see in the, the, the bark, le cos, this, this, this is where the tree was grafted. Voilà. You can still clearly see these grafting marks, and Laurent tells me that there's an interesting local tale surrounding it. Ils prenaient leurs couteaux et ils greffaient des châtaigniers. So this was done by, by shepherds who were bored while they were waiting, watching their sheep. And they took their knives and they grafted their favorite chestnut shoots onto, onto a wild tree. Voilà. Grown here since Roman times, the chestnut tree has become an iconic symbol of the region. It's known locally as the bread tree because it gave this remote region everything they needed to survive. They made flour from it, ate the chestnuts, and built with it. 
So, ready to do some cooking here. I've been given permission to light a fire here in the woods, so I'm going to put these chestnuts, or châtaignes, to good use and cook up a local speciality, chestnut soup. Over the fire it goes. Fantastic. So basically here they've got various varieties of chantaine. The names are... Qu'est-ce que les... Pellegrine. Pellegrine. Figaretta. Figarette. Dauphine. And Dauphine. Wow. The prince. And seeing how these chestnuts play such a big part of life in the Cévennes has been the jewel in the crown. A great way to end my journey. The soup's uh, coming close to being completed and we're going to have a real chestnut feast here. We've got this wonderful baguette made from chestnut flour and a saucisson made from wild boar, which of course fatten themselves absolutely beautifully on the fallen chestnuts from the wild chestnuts, which aren't eaten. A peu de lait. A peu de lait, some, a little voilà. bit of milk. Voilà, très bien. And mix it. It's voilà. ready, to, ready to eat. La bajana, la soupe sevonola. Is that the name of the dish? Bajana. 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 The, let's try some. It's very nice. I feel I've discovered a truly unspoilt world here in the Cévennes. This really is one of France's best kept secrets. Next, I'll be traveling south to a very different landscape. The hot, dry, vibrant countryside of Provence. Next, we return to Weatherfield. Will Todd find out the truth about Callum's killer? It's Coronation Street. Then later at nine, our party planners are back. It's brief encounters here on ITV as Nita finds out why Steph's confidence has deserted her. <laughs>